Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us, and especially since it's a Saturday. It's a Saturday afternoon where I'm based. My name is Ruth Nyambura. I'm a feminist political ecologist and work on the intersections of gender, economy, and ecological justice. I coordinate the Hands Off Mother Earth campaign, popularly known as HOME, and I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. The HOME campaign is a global coalition of civil society organizations, popular movements, indigenous peoples, peasant organizations, academics, intellectuals, writers, workers, artists, and other concerned citizens from around the world who oppose geoengineering as a dangerous, unnecessary, and unjust proposal to tackle climate change. We reject any further entrenchment of fossil fuel economies. We reject geoengineering as an attempt to uphold a failed status quo and divert attention from emissions reductions and the real solutions to the climate crisis. We stand united to oppose field experiments and deployment of such technologies and call upon organizations and concerned citizens to join this campaign. We are committed to protecting Mother Earth and defending our rights territories and peoples. Our session today is titled Implications of Geoengineering Technologies on Locally Led Adaptation Actions. And this, this session is um, the brainchild of several organizations, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, the ETC Group, and of course, Hands of Mother Earth Campaign. Today, our speakers will be weaving through several structural critiques of geoengineering, techno fixes, and other false solutions to the climate crisis. In addition, and importantly, we will hear from our speakers about the phenomenal and regenerative work being championed by global grassroots movements fighting for climate justice. The panel will be composed mainly of representatives of organizations from Asia Pacific, Africa, and the Americas. And these representatives work, from, work in organizations that promote actions and advocacy around um, agroecology and other ecologically sustainable, equitable, and participatory solutions to the climate crisis led by local communities. The Home Campaign wants to sincerely thank the International Center for Climate and Development, ICAD, for organizing this conference. Without further ado, let's begin the session. Our first speaker for today is Neth Daniel from the Philippines. Neth is a very well-respected and longtime climate justice activist and fighter for rights. I'm sure some of you, if not all of us, have bumped into Neth, uh, whether it is at CBD meetings or at the UNFCCC or on a street somewhere um, on a protest or in a march uh, for climate justice or for rights. She presently works as the Asia Director for the ETC Group. Welcome, Neth. Thank you very much, Ruth, for the very kind um, introduction. Yeah, I will kick off the discussion by actually providing an overview of what geoengineering is and also provide some headlines on implications of geoengineering to local adaptation action, which is what this um, session is all about and which is what Kubishona should be, should be concerned about. Um, I have requested my colleague Nikki um, Miranda to please flash my um, my PowerPoint because my internet connection is not so good here at home. I am based in the Philippines here in, in the south, um, in Mindanao, in, in Davao City. Um, so I assume that most of the participants actually have read about, heard about, or probably are, are even following um, developments in geoengineering. So my presentation would just provide an overview, will not go deeply or at length on the technologies, but just to kickstart the, the discussions. I will only provide headlines of the implications because my colleagues um, who are going to present based on their actual experiences um, in resisting geoengineering will actually provide more views and insights on implications of geoengineering to local adaptation actions. 
first slide, please, Nikki. Thank you. So what is um, climate geoengineering? Uh, it's not moving. Yeah, okay. Climate geoengineering um, is actually a set of technologies or a suite of technologies to intentionally, intentionally is um, highlighted there or deliberately intervene in and alter the earth system on a large scale or mega scale, particularly to manipulate the climate or control the thermostat, as some would put it, to counteract some of the effects of climate, climate change. It is, um, by and large, and in all aspects of it, a technological fix or solution to climate, to climate change. Um, next slide, um, please. There are actually um, three large um, categories, big categories of geoengineering techniques. In many literature, you will, you will actually just find two, and these two are carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management. But for ETC, since we started working on following and also analyzing the potential impact and also monitoring the development of geoengineering, we have always um, um, used a third category, uh, which is weather modification. And as I will go through um, these technologies um, on, a, on a broad stroke because of um, time limitation. So carbon dioxide removal or CDR um, aims to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere after they have been emitted. So they're already out there and the technologies under carbon dioxide removal and some of them are even um, are even included in that broader term called negative emissions technology. They aim to suck out um, carbon from the atmosphere that have already been um, emitted or already um, lying around in the, in the atmosphere. The other um, category is called solar radiation management um, or solar engineering, solar geoengineering um, in some um, literature. And the aim of SRM technologies is mainly to reflect the sunlight into space to reduce the warming effect no, of climate change. Um, so you could see the stark um, difference between these two um, technologies and even more when you go into weather modification, which is far below the radar of those uh, following geoengineering in general, because they would always say, Weather modification or the manipulation or modification of the weather has always been there from the 50s, you know, including cloud seeding and all that. But we, in our analysis, this has to go under geoengineering because a lot of the weather modification um, interventions have actually brought um, impacts that are around um, changes, um, uh, modifying the weather, but also has um, massive impact on ecosystems and ecological balance and many of them are actually not even investigated there are some very controversial ones um, that have made it to the mainstream media but largely this is below the radar so most of the literature would just focus on cdr and um, solar radiation management or srm next um, slide please nikki us at etc um <laughs> We actually um, use the lens of the potential impact and also the, the um, actual situs or site of, of the research and development and also um, potential deployment of geoengineering technologies um, um, in looking and presenting the technologies, the techniques um, that fall under whether CDR or SRM geoengineering um, in, in general. So we look at how they impact or potentially impact land ecosystem or terrestrial ecosystem, ocean and marine environment, and also the air or, or atmosphere. Um, this um, very nice um, cartoon uh, presented by Encyclopedia Britannica has always been useful and, and handy. Um, for us because it captures the lens that we're using um, on looking at um, the different techniques um, in geoengineering. You'll see here that um, examples, no, I'll just run through them, not exhaustive, but just to mention a few, like if you look at 
terrestrial um, geoengineering techniques that are um, implemented or aimed at um, being deployed on land. Um, you have biochar um, production. Also, you have um, genetic engineering um, to develop um, reflective crops or albedo um, to, for, to increase um, surface albedo. Also, um, CCS in many, in many respects, also the carbon capture and storage, many respects also fall under this. Um, and of course, BEX, the bioenergy, um, um, carbon capture and storage are some of the um, examples. Um, with regards to um, marine and ocean um, ecosystem, um, some of the key examples, I think um, um, Sam from Chile will also talk about this on um, iron or iron or nit nitrogen fertilization um, of the marine environment um, to promote the growth of phytoplankton with the aim of sucking carbon from the atmosphere and burying that um, in ocean bed or sea bed forever, quote unquote. Um, also, um, when you go into um, the air, um, you have um, sulfate aerosol injection, um, which is an example of um, solar radiation management. You also have um, the use of uh, mirrors in the sky to create um, sunshade and also marine cloud brightening, um, which is also a form of SRM, um, but would target um, clouds that hover around um, oceans and bodies of, of water. So this is just to um, quickly give a broad strokes of what are the technologies that we're talking about. Feel free to ask questions later, but as I mentioned, my colleagues will also speak um, more in depth into a few of these um, techniques um, of geoengineering, particularly those that are um, have already been or are being um, tested um, out there in the real world, and also those that are um, gaining uh, media attention because of the, the the promises that it gives in terms of uh, potential impact in um, addressing global warming um, in particular. Next, please, Nikki. So just to, to give um, some broad, broad strokes on uh, what we think about um, geoengineering, um, none of these geoengineering techniques uh, will actually address the root causes of climate change. Um, Definitely, um, they aim to partially counteract some of the symptoms, um, in particular solar radiation management, um, which um, claims to address, will address um, warming. And warming, as we know, is just one of the symptoms. It's not the root cause of climate change. Also, it will not address the drivers of climate change, um, namely um, production of fossil fuel, the continuous um, unsustainable production and consumption patterns, also deforestation and unsustainable um, industrial agriculture and food system. This will all continue, whether you um, do a massive amount of geoengineering, any of these technologies will not address those um, drivers of climate change at all. And also, um, Geoengineering creates a captive market um, in many ways. Um, like you're providing a techno fix to a problem without addressing the root causes, at this, um, which at the same time allows um, an escape hatch for those who are uh, promoting um, and behind the drivers of climate change that this is one way for you to address the problems that you're causing without changing the, the root, the, 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 the drivers of, of climate change. Also, um, next please. Um, it is very important to note that geoengineering is, ad, is under UN moratoria. No, these are, this is not just one, but two. I'll go through that. Um, in, in 2008, um, the CBD at its um, eighth conference of the party actually adopted a decision calling for a moratorium on ocean fertilization. Um, after it was brought to the attention of the, of the CBD by a number of countries whose territories have become sites of experiments, large-scale experiments involving iron fertilization, um, 
um, in the case of in the case of um, um, India and also um, South Africa and some parts of, of Ecuador um, in the Galapagos and also the Philippines um, in 2007 and 2008 was also a site of an experiment done by some scientists from Australia for nitrogen uh, fertilization of the of a particular part of the Sulu Sea. So in 2010, um, the CBD at its COP10 COP um, adopted another moratorium, a soft one, um, on all um, climate engineering, climate geoengineering um, techniques, um, with the exception of carbon capture and storage um, due to some some um, political compromises. Um, and that um, moratorium um, from that decision in COP10 was actually affirmed by the CBD in further decisions around this issue in 2012 and in 2016. And as a result of the earlier moratorium adopted by the CBD on ocean fertilization in 2008, the London Protocol and the London Convention Against um, Ocean Dumping took a decision in 2013 to prohibit all ocean fertilization activities um, with the exception of legitimate scientific research, which was well defined um, in the London Convention and London Protocol. And our position um, at EPC from the beginning that we started, from the when we started to follow and monitor um, geoengineering development um, 10, 12 years ago, has always been um, to push for a ban on on these technologies because of the high risk um, involved in this um, in these experiments and for and potential deployment. Next, please. This is my last um, slide. Just to um, give some broad strokes on the implications of geoengineering on local adaptation action. Um, we believe that um, the potential impacts and intended consequences of geoengineering techniques, um, such as CDR um, techniques like ocean fertilization and marine ecosystems, or SRM on, um, on ecosystems in general, um, this um, impacts, this negative impacts on ecosystems and ecological balance would undermine um, local adaptation actions, will actually increase um, the threats that are faced by communities, uh, particularly uh, climate vulnerable countries and communities um, that are already uh, bearing the brunt of, of global warming and climate change in general that would increase um, because of the potential impact, adverse impact and intended consequences um, of these geoengineering techniques no, on ecosystems and ecological balance. One particular um, technique that has been, that has raised a number of concerns in many um, studies, even by proponents themselves, in many of the modeling that they have conducted is solar radiation management, uh, which would, actually bring adverse consequences um, in many parts of the world uh, because of termination shock, like um, SRM, particularly um, uh, the, the um, sulfate, um, the aerosol um, injection could aims to mimic the eruption of volcanoes, uh, which um, on a various investigation and research have actually shown that they could have cooling effects um, on global climate, like um, they aim to mimic um, volcanic eruption and all of the models show that um, once you do it, you cannot just stop it because that would result to termination shock, which could actually bring about um, massive adverse impacts on the climate in general. So you need to adopt measures you know, to um, avoid termination shock and that would require of course, um, global actions, um, largely because of the um, inherent transboundary impact um, of such techniques. No? Um, and um, in order for, for these um, technologies to have um, impact, considerable impact on the climate, they, are, they have to be large scale and being large scale brings about inherent transboundary um, and cross-border consequences. And 
since we're talking here of very complex systems in the atmosphere and ecosystems in general, um, most of the models show that the impact of geoengineering um, techniques, many of them, would actually uh, bring about an equal and an even um, impact across regions and, age and, and areas. And because of this, um, among others, um, the decisions on research and development and deployment of geoengineering um, techniques are inevitably top-down, centralized. And that is um, inherently antithetical to locally-led adaptation um, um, actions. So these are just broad strokes, as I mentioned, um, just to kickstart the discussion and open up um, the stage for my colleagues who would be speaking um, in the panel uh, based on their actual experiences and also actual um, efforts not to resist um, on um, research, um, ongoing research and also um, deployment and real world experiments um, on particular geoengineering um, technology. So feel free to ask questions. Um, um, that route will guide us through um, later. So thank you. Thank you so much, Neth, for your very comprehensive, um, uh, it's always very comprehensive, very good to hear you speak when you take us through um, the technologies themselves and also go beyond um, looking at science in an apolitical way, but thinking through science in terms of the politics and the economics uh, around these technologies. So we are gonna have um, a poll right now, which um, is just a question to, to ask um, those attending, uh, whether uh, the presentation has at least grounded you in, um, you know, the intricacies of geoengineering technologies, because one of the things that we do understand when it comes to geoengineering technologies is that often the language used um, can be very, very technical. In, in such a way that a lot of people feel very disconnected from it. When you tell them about, you know, whether it's SRM or whatever it is, and like, what exactly is that? So one of the things at the home campaign that we aim to do is to demystify um, the science, to, de to demystify the technicalities, you know, to ensure that all of us understand exactly what we are talking about and why we are resisting the geoengineering technologies. So we'd be very happy to know whether, uh, you know, this session, you know, in totality, whether it has brought you closer to a firmer understanding of geoengineering technologies. So once again, uh, thank you very much. We'll be returning to questions um, later. So, I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Um, okay, just one second. I'm going to introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is from Chile. Sam Leva is from Teram, Chile. And I want to sort of, uh, one of the things that happens when we talk about the climate crisis or climate injustice is, is sort of, we often feel like it's such a big terminology. One of the things that we know is that in the last one year, Chile has had a very exciting, for lack of a better term, year. Initially, the climate um, conference in 2019 was supposed to be held in Chile. It was moved to Madrid because of a popular uprising um, that happened in, uh, in the country. We all know that Chile is considered the ground zero of uh, neoliberal politics. And we saw that, you know, what this popular uprising did, of course, led to, you know, uh, the changing of the dictatorship constitution, and we see what people power does. But at the same time, when you look about when, you, when we look at Chile, Chile has large plantations, one of those countries also suffering from the effects of the climate crisis has really large uh, plantation farms around uh, industrial agriculture and we know industrial agriculture is one of the leading uh, causes of emissions. Um, across the world and of course deforestation but also plantations around uh, eucalyptus um, uh, eucaly eucalyptus. Um, 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 uh, what is it called eucalyptus. Um, trees. So of course, this is a country also, or this is a region actually that also has to be seen in terms of a very particular context of what is happening uh, with regard to the climate crisis. But also we know from, this, uh, from the several reports that we've gotten over the last few years from Global Witness that uh, Latin America 
leads in terms of um, the murders and assassinations of environmental rights defenders. So this is important context to keep because this conversation that we're having is about geoengineering technologies, is about adaptation, but it's also we have to remember when you talk about climate justice, what are we talking about? Who are we talking about? These are people's lives, people on the front lines of this crisis. And so Sam Labor works for Teram Chile. Teram Chile is currently working um, you know, on an ocean fertilization project that has been proposed to happen in Chilean waters by Oceanos. So Teram is trying to also make Chile ratify the London Protocol uh, Amendment to create an ex ante assessment uh, framework. And so Sam will tell us more about the resistance to this ocean fertilization project and perhaps even uh, tell us a bit more about, you know, the context around climate justice and resistance within uh, Chile. Sam, welcome. Thank you, Ruth. Um, would you mind to ch uh, uh, charge the, the presentation that I got? Do you have it? So, thank, um, hey everyone. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm from not not in the in the capital. Mo, mo, I'm actually two hours away from it. Uh, in the in the in the no, it's a Cynthia uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, can you change it? Uh, yeah, I'm from uh, Isla Isla Negra, who is a place near, I mean, in the coast near the capital. It's a, a couple hours, you know, from the capital. And yeah, we were actually trying, as Ruth said, you know, try to get um, uh, ratify the, the amendment made by the parties in the London Protocol and the London Convention, and try to actually to ensure that you know, Chile's, Chile's ocean has a framework to defend itself, you know, against the risk uh, of the iron fertilization that is one uh, of the marine geoengineering that is being regulated by the, by the London um, protocol. So can I move a little forward, please? Next one. So as Ruth said, well, Terran Foundation is a civil society organization that has uh, born in 1997 and we're a very um, young team, as you can see there in the picture. And we actually have experience on created and generated a public debate, mostly on uh, environmental issues, but also we have, you know, um, also sometimes, you know, um, proposals about uh, the economic model or climate justice and, the, and so on. And energy, we were, we were working on energy, mining, salmon farming, climate change, biodiversity, and among, and among other topics. But um, we were probably can say that we are one of the oldest uh, organization in, in Chile and, and we are pride also to, to work in this uh, and be part of the camp of um, Mother, uh, Mother Earth campaign. Next, please. As, as, as um, Nef said, you know, the, the Convention for the Prevention of Marine Pollution by Dumping of Waste and Other Matters that actually we call London uh, Convention defines ocean, ocean fertilization and any activity undertaken by human because it's not also because it, it, it can be, you know, the ocean fertilization can be naturally by, you know, the volcano eruption, but this one is have to be undertaken by humans with the primary intention of stimulating primary of pro productivity in the ocean. And what is important that, because actually uh, uh, is, is, it is key for actually to say that the oceanos uh, intention or experiment that they want to carry on and in the Chilean Ocean, you know, uh, they want to separate it from this uh, defined because they are saying that they, their experiment is not actually a geoengineering. They are saying that they, the iron fertilization that they want to deploy in the Chilean Ocean, it's, it's not for, uh, it's not relate, related with geoengineering rather than they are actually trying to improve uh, fisheries management. So this is important the, to define and actually if the ocean fertilization 
uh, frame, you know, what the Ocean Oceanos uh, um, want to do. Also, by the Royal Society in 2009, geoengineering is defined as the limited large scale manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract anthropogenic climate change. So if you actually match the, the both uh, definitions, you know, you can see clearly that the, the experiment by Oceanos fit in this description. Next, please. Um, as as uh, Neth said, the, the Biodiversity Convention uh, established a de facto moratorium and the London Convention has, have, has been regulated, the ocean fertilization and geoengineering. Because when, when we actually, when we talk about the London Convention, the London Convention tried to, with this amendment, uh, with this decision, uh, 9 uh, slash uh, 16 C, what they do is try to address and, uh, and uh, put a framework to uh, regulate all kind of marine geoengineering. But currently, the only one that is being uh, put there is the uh, iron fertilization. And probably in, 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 in the future, there will be other technologies that have been uh, in, included in this, uh, in this uh, regulation about uh, marine and geoengineering. Next, please. So, what what it says, or, or, what, or what had been actually the, the 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 process? The process actually started back in two thousand eight when the when the London Protocol and the London Convention they agree to actually have a look and understanding how uh, the geo the marine geoengineering can have uh, an influence on on what they try to regulate and at after that, in 2010, they come out with a framework that actually regulate how you can um, ex, ex ante uh, evaluate the whole risk about the, you know, uh, geoengineering in, 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 in the, in, in, and also review, you know, what, what's also the, the technologies that can be considered as part of the marine, of the marine geoengineering. And after that, after they created this, this framework, they said, look, that is not enough to actually to ensure that the parties will um, use this framework to evaluate any kind of risk that may be presented by uh, a new technology of marine, uh, marine geoengineering. So they say, look, what do we really want is to agree an amendment to the protocol and, and by, by, that, by that step, they want to actually create a new framework and the parties should supposed to ratify that amendment and create it and add this uh, new uh, framework as part of the national uh, regulation system. So they, they, they were actually um, at least five years uh, analyzing the, the consequences, analyzing how it should be better to do you know, uh, in terms of provide a, a framework that all the parties of the L London Convention and, and the London Protocol, you know, should be used to avoid uh, any any risk that being uh, that should be presented by uh, any geoengineering activities. So the amendment, the amendment modified Article One of the definition and says that marine geoengineering. Uh, broadly, not just iron fertilization, means a deliberate de intervention in the marine environment to manipulate natural processes, including the counteract anthropogenic climate change and or in, uh, its impact, and has the potential to reduce detrimental effects, especially when those effects can be widespread, durable, or severe. Why is important? Because actually this try to not just define uh, iron, iron fertilization, uh, because uh, um, as Neth described, there is several technologies, but what is actually the main concern from the London Protocol and the, and, and the London Convention is to regulate marine geoengineering and especially at, at, at the moment, uh, iron fertilization. Next, please. 
Thank you. So what is the problem? What is actually, what is important the case in Chile? And as probably it will happen everywhere in, in the world, there is no um, legal body that establishes an environmental assessment of marine geoengineering everywhere, right? So that is actually one of the main reasons uh, because the, the London Convention can, can uh, up with this uh, amendment. We have, uh, anyway, we have a um, supreme decree that comes from the, the, the Pinochet dictatorship that establishes a registration framework for any scientific initiative that including marine geoengineering in, in jurisdictional waters. However, in, in, in its article two, the requirements are not on, on an environmental evaluative nature nor about the expected impact on marine ecosystem. That is, means that requirements are just formal to identify the data, who, who is the ship, who is the captain of the ship, who will be the scientist involved in this uh, 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 experiment. But in any case, it can be actually an ex ante evaluation about the impact that may produce or may be produced by the, by the experiment. So we don't have really a, a, a capacity, our legal framework right now, it's, uh, it doesn't have the capacity to avoid any kind of experiment uh, of this nature. So that's why we need to ratify the amendment made by the London Convention and its protocol in order to ensure that Chile will have a framework to avoid any kind of uh, geoengineering uh, developing in, in, in our waters. So, but what about it's the, the environmental uh, basis law that actually create the environmental uh, assessment system? It, it, it does not contemplate the environmental evaluation uh, for geoengineering experiment because it is a, actually an experiment, right? So, uh, and that framework is to, is for evaluate uh, uh, project investment project like uh, can be an underwater mining project or any any kind of uh, developing project but not an experiment you know the, the, the environmental system is not for that purpose so we don't have nothing to defend ourselves you know against the uh, the the risk that is presented by uh, the engineering uh, in in our ocean next please So, um, and what is the Oceanos experiment about? They are trying to misguide you, you know, and uh, uh, differences from the engineering. They say they are not doing any kind of geoengineering, but what they do actually is uh, try to fertilize uh, the ocean by uh, dumping hundreds, uh, no, 10 tons of iron uh, in, in the sea. And they are actually targeting some uh, areas that it, uh, are part of the, 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 the preservation of fisheries because the, those fisheries are really important, not just only for Chile, but also for the whole parties that have interest in the South, uh, in the South Pacific that is actually being regulated by international bodies like the South Pacific RF, RFMO, that is a regional fishery management organization. So, and they are trying to target some fisheries in Chile and Peru because the Chile and Peru, they are big players. Uh, uh, when you talk about the fisheries amount and, and how you know, the important are these uh, both countries you know, in, in matter of regulation and amount of how much fish they actually caught. Um, so they say that's really simple. So adding nutrients to an Impoverished marine ecosystem will stimulate photosynthesis, causing plant plankton to grow. But it's not just like that. It's more, more, more complex, and that's the reason why seven uh, marine institutes uh, 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 from Chile, you know, they uh, raise their hands and they say this uh, experiment should be not happening because they are actually putting in risk not only the fisheries in, in matter of economic uh, point of view, but also the uh, um, uh, eco marine ecosystem all along the north part of, of Chile. 
So the, actually, it's not the only the, the civil society organization w that are saying, look, this is not a good idea. It's actually the uh, marine uh, academia who is actually saying this is uh, a very bad idea. So um, as I said, you know, uh, Oceano's approach is to restoring the fish stock as unique idea, but we know that actually it fits on, on inside of the definition what is actually marine geoengineering, what is actually geoengineering, and how actually it's been defined by the uh, by the London Protocol uh, Amendment. Uh, we need to uh, also uh, remember that the Oceanos assure that uh, the 2012 experiment in Canada, they they didn't make it, but people from uh, from that experiment are part of the Oceanos now. And they are saying that uh, the 2012 experiment was a huge, uh, huge success, but it's been actually, um, uh, you know, uh, not agreed by uh, the Canada authorities and also the uh, indigenous community over there. And they try to, next please, and they try to actually get some support by the uh, artisanal fishermen here, also from the, um, from the authorities, but they have never actually approached them to have any kind of support. So they, they keep with this analytical practice. So what do we want? That is very much simple. We want to the ratification of the London Protocol and London Convention Amendment to ensure that Chile has a mechanism that prevent the development of marine and geoengineering um, and also you know, uh, any kind of experiment to avoid that effect which are unexpected and the consequences which cannot be anticipated, especially in the social and environmental impact of fisheries. And we have a huge uh, area, you know, Chile is a very long country. So we have a lot of, you know, fisheries and also fishermen all along the, our coast. And they are especially under uh, social and environmental in, uh, uh, risk. So, um, and also Chile, it's uh, also some sort of marine or ocean champion in the international arena. You know, we were actually pushing for the Blue Cup in, as Ruth said in, 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 in last year, when we couldn't make it actually the, the COP25 in Santiago and we, you know, uh, ending doing it in, in Madrid. But uh, we actually have some position as a Chilean government and authorities to actually to become as part of a champion from the ocean. But if this is a big stain on that paper, you know, in that position, because actually we're not taking with uh, much uh, will uh, this amendment, we need to do it. We actually have the risk, the risk is over there. You know, it's not just things that we want to spend a lot of more time waiting for it, but we need to do it right now. So we actually, because it made a void with the local lead adaptation actions, such as marine protected areas. Actually, Chile last year uh, create huge areas in, in, in Chile and as a marine park. And actually we are covering now mostly the half of our EE set. So we are having uh, uh, protected uh, actions our ocean, but any kind of marine geoengineering experiment will clash with that uh, uh, intention. And finally, uh, establish administrative measures to ensure that environmental assessment of marine fertilization experiment fulfills compliance with the regulation in the amendment, not just only in Chile, but only uh, but on, uh, also with the uh, with the uh, this international body that the that the London Convention. I think that's all. Thank you, guys, and I'm I'm glad to to receive any question uh, for it on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, there was a question that just came in the chat box about uh, a slide. I believe we'll be sharing um, uh, the slides that the panelists have presented. 
uh, because it's a bit difficult to tell uh, a panelist to go back to um, to what they just presented. So we're very we're going to share the slides. Please don't worry uh, about that. Sam, once again, thank you very much for giving us um, the context in Chile, but also opening it up to uh, the context of um, of resistance. And so we are going to go to the next. Um, we're going to go to the next um, speaker. The next speaker is uh, Lindsay Lewis. Lindsay Lewis is a research and advocacy officer uh, working at the African Center for Bi Biodiversity. The Africa Center for Biodiversity is based in Johannesburg, um, South Africa. And it's one of those organizations, if you're working on the continent of Africa, when it comes to anything from seed and trade laws, um, to thinking through genetically modified foods, to working with um, peasant organizations and farmers organizations across, um, across the continent of Africa in terms of resisting this new changes, definitely the African Center for Biodiversity is one of those organizations that sits at the center and has been doing this work for um, close to 30 years. So Lindsay, before you start, um, one of the things like I'd like to talk about is that a week ago, um, the Home Campaign uh, produced an article, a research article detailing uh, geoengineering activities on the continent on Africa. And this analysis of data shows that on the continent, um, geoengineering has received little attention so far. Nevertheless, about 70 geoengineering projects, which which is basically 5% of the total documented projects were executed on the African continent. The majority of these projects are research projects and have been initiated and funded by public and private donors from North America, Europe, and Australia. Very few programs are known to have been launched by any African institution, and very few researchers are st stationed in Africa participate in this geoengineering discussions. In recent years, the number of active geoengineering projects on the African continent has actually declined. In contrast, interest in African land for geoengineering activities has grown. And as well, you know, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, in the global land rush, uh, the continent has sat at the center of the renewed interest in, in land, with many actually calling it a second form of colonization. So Africa is not a significant, we know that Africa is not a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions, but the continent um, is the most perhaps the most is the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Sub-Sahara Africa is producing less than 4% of the global emissions and the per capita greenhouse gas emissions in Sub-Sahara Africa are more than five times lower compared to the emissions in the USA. Although the entire African continent emits less carbon than the US or Japan, Africa is likely to experience the impacts of climate change sooner and more intensely than other regions. Some African regions are already experiencing warming at more than twice the global rate. Despite the severe consequences of the climate crisis on the African continent, African scientists are not well represented in the climate debate, um, e.g. in the four IPCC assessment reports published between 1990 and 2007. They also make up only 3.1% of the IPC authors in total. And I'd like to say that we're gonna paste the link to that article if it hasn't been pasted already in uh, the chat box, but this is something that, uh, this is an article, research article that was produced um, a, week of, a week ago by the research department working on this, but also to say that uh, the home campaign has a full uh, map uh, visualizing the geoengineering projects, not just on the continent of Africa, but across um, the globe. So, um, Lindsay, um, please welcome uh, to the conversation. Okay, thank you so much, Ruth. Um, let me just share my slides with you. Um, thanks. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening uh, to you all. And thank you so much for inviting me to share our thoughts with you as the African Center for Biodiversity. Um, I think Ruth gave a good introduction to the organization. Um, and I'm coming to you today from uh, the Kingdom of Eswatini, while the organization is housed in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, so Last year, we conducted research which culminated in a series of papers looking at the converging and compounding shocks hitting the African continent. 
Of course, these include climate change, impacts, pest infestations, epidemics, conflict, and the implications specifically on smallholder farmers, which is our focus. And this painted quite a terrifying picture. Um, in these papers, we looked at the interconnectedness between climate change, deforestation, industrial agriculture, and generally extractivist development, and their role in driving political and social instability and food insecurity on the continent, which are further fueling the systemic interwoven and existential crises we face. And this work allowed us as well to honor the work that has been done by the many movements um, over many decades. Of course, we come from the food sovereignty movement and our focus often, as was said, is around agriculture and food systems. So in our part of this discussion, um, I'll look at it in three parts and hopefully can contribute to this, into this debate. Um, as we are not uh, experts on geoengineering as such, but hopefully this will contribute to this discussion through different aspects around false solutions. Um, so this talk is in three parts. I will discuss some of this new thinking and the political framing for us based on these key findings. And of course, in this pandemic and post-pandemic world that we're in, and it's really shifted our thinking quite a lot in that way. Um, the false solutions which are being offered and particularly focusing on what is called so-called nature-based solutions and our work that's going on there. And finally, um, give some food for thought around the pan-Africanist decolonization agenda and some of the work we are doing with our partners on the, on the continent um, in building this resistance. So as many of you will know, uh, we are witnessing the continuous degradation of socio-ecological systems under the guise of development loans and aid, deepening the dependency on destructive, short-sighted and short-lived carbon and capital intensive projects. There is a focus on global agricultural and forest value chains. And all of these contribute to creating conditions of extreme vulnerability and an incapacity to re respond to shocks such as climate disasters, fall armyworm, and of course, the current COVID-19 pandemic. The World Bank has been instrumental in ensuring that huge tracts of land is secured for agribusiness. This private development has resulted in dispossessing smallholder farmers as traditional forage and grounds are usurped for mining, clear-cut logging, and industrial agriculture. This is entrenching the unequal relations between Africa and the rest of the world, and not only the global north. The opening up of primary forests for mining, logging, plantations, and oil and gas extraction is aided by financialization, a phenomenon understood as the growing power and influence of global finance, aptly labeled rogue capitalism by Fiona International. In the DRC, for example, the ongoing conflict historically linked to its mineral wealth has played a major role in escalating the Ebola disease from a zoonotic spillover to an epidemic. And Ebola compounded the pre-existing shocks stemming from the interconnection between biodiversity loss, economic subordination, armed conflict, fragile farming systems, and a depleted public health system after decades of state failure and austerity measures imposed by the IMF and the World Bank. Africa is on the frontier of the expansion of industrial palm oil expansion and palm oil production with an estimated 22 million hectares of land targeted for the conversion to palm plantations, much in Western Central Africa. The expansion of, part of these plantations of oil palm, as well as coffee, tea and sugarcane has undermined local agricultural activities and is pushing local agro-pastoralists off the land. Ecological degradation is principally driven by multinational corporations and agribusiness, which behave like predators, exploiting tax evasion in these countries and operating through illicit financial flows. Our foundations for life, the rich nat natural and human resources are being continuously, systematically and rapaciously extracted and destroyed. Consequently, smallholder farmers end up turning to paid work on mines in the region. Many smallholder farmers are either encouraged to opt for monoculture production or to work as poorly paid and exploited laborers on farms. These trends towards greater conversion of land to monocrops, including tree monocultures, contribute hugely to eroding and undermining local food security and livelihoods. The extreme pressures on livelihoods as a result of armed conflict, the extractive sector, 
and the absence of support for smallholder farmers is forcing more and more people into precarious conditions. We are clearly seeing the interconnections between extractivism, ecological collapse, precarious livelihoods, and the relationship between ecological disturbance and human health being shaped by distorted logics of austerity, profiteering, and the financialization of life, and in the Ebola case, even death. Addressing pandemics, land degradation, and deforestation cannot be delinked from building economies and food systems that are grounded in the needs of people, particularly smallholder farmers and thriving ecosystems. To achieve this, we must utterly reject and resist against the ecocidal logics of commodification, financialization, and extractivism for the human and ecological liberation on the continent. Otherwise, Africa is destined to become an economic and ecological wasteland, feeding the insatiable appetite of developed countries under the guise of indefinite growth. Yet despite the intersectional and systemic issues we face, these so-called solutions that are being offered do little more than allow for the continuation of business as usual. So for the purposes of this discussion, I will briefly outline the concept and the contentions around the so-called nature-based solutions, NBS, or as I call simply, BS, as being discussed under the CBD. The term nature-based solutions has emerged in the last decade as a catch-all phrase defined by the ICN as seen here. Um, it has been adopted quickly by international development and conservation groups and industry as the preferred approach to dealing with a range of intersecting global issues, including climate change, um, climate change mitigation and adaptation, disaster risk reduction, economic and social development, human health, food security, water security, and reversing ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss. And while this may sound fantastic, it is incredibly dangerous and misleading in the way it's being used and driven. And with its lack of actual definition at the Convention on Biological Diversity, it has become this catch-all phrase to mean a range of different activities. What we are deeply concerned about is that the most vocal and aggressive advocates for NBS are alliances between some of the world's worst carbon emitters and conservation groups who act as advisors for these companies and even countries. Conservation International and the African the Wildlife Fund, the WWF, they in fact fund the African Group of Negotiators on Biodiversity. Um, and in a meeting that we had on this issue, we highlighted the role of conservation groups in Africa and how they actually threaten the sovereignty um, of Africa's natural resources. Um, the conservation group, the conservation industry rather, is also proposing that under the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, that protected areas should be doubled to 30% of the planet. This is known as the 30 by 30 target. And if you look at this map, you can, see, you can clearly see which land they are after to continue to sequester the carbon that they continue to emit and to offset their responsibility in biodiversity loss and ecological degradation and hide the unscrupulous activities that are driving local elitism and corporate clientelism. They also use incredibly limited, contentious and acontextual research to justify this agenda and continue business as usual all despite the fact that none of these so-called solutions can substitute for continued greenhouse gas emissions, nor substitute for the complex ecosystems under the perverse concepts of carbon and biodiversity offsetting, offering misleading and indeed dangerous terms such as net zero and net gains. NBS, along with these 30 by 30 targets, will result in what could be the biggest land grab of all time. With a focus on fortress conservation, despite the fact that research shows that, the, that uh, biodiversity is best protected under indigenous people's land. Indigenous peoples and farmers movements are rejecting the term NBS because of its co-option and the risk that due to its lack of de definition, it will legitimize harmful practices. Of course, many will argue that we cannot just simply throw the baby out with the bathwater as such. And it is important to note that ecological infrastructure um, tied to concepts such as ecosystem-based adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and sustainable livelihoods are not necessarily problematic in themselves, and nor is, are these concepts new at all. Um, for example, mangroves. Um, restoring mangrove ecosystems, of course, can offer resilience to a landscape as well as offer adaptation and potential socioeconomic benefits, but this is a discrete and local issue. 
Such interventions do not address the systemic drivers of biodiversity loss, land degradation, climate change, and poverty, and undermine the political nature of this issue. Over the years, there have been a variety of market-based mechanisms that have been mainstreamed to tackle deforestation, emissions, and biodiversity loss, such as Red Plus, payment for environmental services, natural capital accounting, and these have continuously failed to reduce carbon emissions, sequester carbon, nor curb the rapid biodiversity loss as a result of industrial agricultural expansion, urbanization, and increased consumption patterns. These have simply, again, allowed for business as usual to continue, and in fact, deepening and accelerating our converging crises. The term nature-based solutions should provoke a series of questions. Solutions to what? Whose solutions actually are we solving? Who will be profiting from these solutions? Who is continuing to emit carbon, actually, despite the fact that we're in this crisis? Who and what is responsible for biodiversity loss and ecological degradation? How can these issues be solved without addressing the heart of the issue, um, and rather than just seeking to outsource this responsibility? And really, what will be the trade-off, and who and what will pay the price for this trade-off? And in any event, these solutions simply just don't work. So again, nature-based solutions is simply a catch-all phrase that has become meaningless, perpetuating business as usual under this concept of indefinite growth and really shifting the burden of, of emissions and biodiversity loss to poor countries and essentially avoiding paying financial obligations under various conventions. There is also the potential that foreign aid becomes conditional to opening markets to NBS under the term of sustainable finance. This is incredibly dangerous terrain. With a strong focus from African governments on NBS as a means to stimulate the so-called also green or circular or bioeconomy, which again is embedded in business as usual, this business as usual economic logic, where Africa will undoubtedly again fall at the wayside. As we are already witnessing, the bioeconomy allows for the repurposing of old and outdated market and technology-based instruments entrenched in capitalism, an overutilization of environmental resources, ecosystems, and sinks commodification and instrumentalization of nature under the guise of its protection, spatial and social exclusion, depoliticizing the bait and the roots of these crises, and reducing the issues to a question of growth, jobs, and poverty reduction, while even ironically failing to achieve this. It would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. It is increasingly recognized that decoupling economic growth and environmental destruction is simply not possible under capitalism such as the so-called green economy. Growth oriented policy, including the green economy is utterly misleading. We are seeing a range of ridiculous ideas being considered in BS. And just to give you a little taste of that, for example, GM mosquitoes to deal with malaria, gene drives, which have ecological and implications as well. Um, ecological engineering for conservation, sort of private neo-conservation parks and even ge geoengineering itself, as we're discussing. And this really just brings the whole definition again into question, what exactly are nature-based solutions? So for us, this is what we are calling the empire's recovery plan, especially in the era where we are now during this pandemic. And this clearly reinforces the power dynamics creating and perpetuating under-resourced African economies and a neo-colonial geopolitical and geoeconomic landscape. So just to, to end off, for us, we are strongly believing that we need to be developing our own recovery plan as Africa and for this continent to lead the world in this way. Our work has led us to the urgent necessity of the, of the decolonization agenda, drawing on the myriad of organizing and practices that are already in existence and in flow to the construction of a progressive movement-driven pan-African agenda appropriate to the task at hand. Of course, there is so much good work, work going on on the ground. And all this work is essential in joining the cracks in the capitalist structure, which keeps the continent and indeed the world as we know it at the brink of collapse. We need to build the reality we want and build a counter movement to decolonize African economies and ecologies. And that is where we're at at the moment. And we are working with our partners to build this pan-African agenda to work with movements across sectors and across thematic areas 
um, because this is key because we cannot operate in our silos to address these really deep systemic issues um, and really to situate politically this agenda driven by solidarity and indeed love for all life on earth and we welcome collaboration on this in this pivotal time in history and I hope that we can discuss that more as we move forward. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things that um, is a point of reflection in your in your presentation, and I'm sure it's going to lead into our next and final speaker, is that the question of power, you know, and power relations is often not talked about. You know, there's this tendency to think about science or technology in such an apolitical way that we forget that some of the countries or some of the continents of the world are living through the afterlives of colonization, for example, you know, thinking through questions around uh, political economy, thinking through the things you're saying as, you know, these are countries or continents in which land grabbing, whether from local elites, you know, international elites, transnational corporation still continues. So if you're going to have a conversation, a meaningful conversation about climate justice, these are, con these are questions that need to be centered um, um, need to be centered, you know, not just um, this, you know, strange belief that, you know, science and technology are completely divorced from everyday people's realities and questions of power in multiple and intersecting ways. So thank you so much, Lindsay, for bringing that to the fore. I think it is an important conversation that grassroots movements across the world, and certainly that the home campaign has continued and will continue to center into the, into the future. So our next and final um, speaker for today is Cynthia Mellon. Cynthia Melon is also someone that I'm sure many of you have had uh, the opportunity to uh, to encounter, whether it's uh, in the streets, um, you know, marching for climate justice, or you've seen some of the work that you know she's uh, she's produced. So Cynthia is a policy coordinator at the Climate Justice Alliance, a growing member alliance in the climate justice movement of 70 urban and rural frontline communities, organizations, and supporting networks in the climate justice movement. CJA is dedicated to building just a just transition away from extractive systems of production, consumption, and political oppression and toward resilient, regenerative, and equitable economies. Based in the United States, uh, she, uh, Cynthia is based in the United States, but is a friend and ally, as I've said, to many global South movements and is often um, in the streets um, with us and thinking through and offering her support uh, around our resistance work to um, the influence of transnational corporations, but also supporting the regenerative work that grassroots movements in the global south are doing. Cynthia, welcome. Hi, good morning. It's morning here. Um, I'm speaking to you from the city of Newark, New Jersey, which is 20 minutes by train from Manhattan, from New York, uh, but it's uh, a different world. It's the third oldest city in the United States uh, with a lot of history. And it is, uh, the entire city has been designated by the US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency as what they call an environmental justice community because the entire city is heavily overburdened um, with environmental stress, with polluting processes and, and installations and, and a long history of that. So uh, I'm going to speak to you today from both the point of view of, of working in Climate Justice Alliance and from my own community, because I've, I rarely get that chance, but I'm going to be talking about that. Um, I'm calling this climate and pollution in environmental justice communities in the United States. Where is geoengineering in that? If I did not work with Climate Justice Alliance uh, and simply carried on my life as a resident here, I would not even know the term geoengineering because it is not used. Next slide, please. Oh. Great. So uh, Ruth very ably and wonderfully saved me time by describing the Climate Justice Alliance. Uh, we now have 74 member groups that span the United States and, and Puerto Rico and Guam. 
Um, mainly our members are frontline communities of color, low income communities, what is often termed grassroots communities. Environmental communities, as I said, are those that are heavily overburdened with pollution. That term came about around 1991 um, with veterans of the civil rights movement in the United States when people began to realize that the most polluted communities, the places where all the dumping uh, of toxic waste and so on was taking place were communities of color and that very often the communities were not informed and had no idea that these things were happening all around them or on their periphery or the danger of the type of pollution that was being imported into the community or generated there. So nearly always the EJ communities are located near polluting facilities, ports, airports, waste incinerators, um, landfills, convergences of, of um, transportation, such as like, oh, there'll be a lot of major highways plus the rail yard, plus all the other, um, both commercial and, and um, I guess you'd say daily use transport systems things like scrap metal yards um, abound right next to houses because cities that are really old have no, um, those things are just kind of grandfathered in, they're always there and there hasn't been any mechanism for changing or shifting that. Next slide, please. So um, in 2013, Climate Justice Alliance was founded. At that time, I was the um, environmental justice organizer in my community. And uh, I quickly saw that we should be aligning ourselves there. We weren't used to working outside of the city, um, mostly a local, um, plenty of things to do right here to try to support the community uh, in the midst of um, the types of effects that in very powerful pollution has. Our asthma rate is 25%. As soon as you step outside of the city, that drops to about 12%. So that's a direct result of the kinds of, of emissions that are taking place from being a port city and so on. So CJA, CJA's um, Climate Justice Alliance priorities are to inspire and organize bold actions by the communities on the front lines of climate change and to challenge the extractive economy that's harming people and ecosystems, to build resilient and regenerative and equitable economies rooted in place-based webs of social and ecological relationships to expose the false promises and false mechanisms that are posed as solutions to the climate crisis so that precious resources are not allocated to programs that exacerbate social or economic inequality or cause further ecological disruption and fourth, to confront governments and industry to act boldly on climate change. Uh, we're building local alternatives that center traditional ecological and cultural knowledge and create a pathway for a regenerative future. And in talking about that, I just wanted to say a bit about our members. Um, we're, some of the examples are community groups like my own. And in the United States, that is mainly communities of color, Black, Lat Latinx, Indigenous, Asian peoples um, that are concentrated in communities and very often in those communities, the refinery will be there um, and a num number of other polluting conditions. So um, we have member groups that are pretty, some of them can be very large, but they're community-based. We have large networks like the Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, along with other member Indigenous groups. Um, an example of, of, of the agricultural groups we have is Organización Boricua de Agroecología, which is links about 135 small and medium farms in Puerto Rico that are organic or transitioning to organic. And uh, many of the community organizations that we work with are um, pioneers in bringing solar and wind power to low income communities and others are supporting food sovereignty and food production and different types of um, entrepreneurship. So all of our organizations are working to strengthen the economic situation in their communities and at the same time combating the type of pollution and so on that um, is taking place. 
CJA in our policy group, we've just, as everyone known, come through a, 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 a tremendously difficult um, administration. We've come through uh, an election. And prior to that, there was a long and very complex primary structure where there were multiple candidates. We are not um, what they call a 501c4. We can't lobby. We certainly can talk to people and we do talk to legislative staff all the time. Um, I can say that the whole concept of geoengineering um, in 2018, when I started speaking with congressional staff or candidates staff, uh, I'm not gonna name those candidates, they're all well known. They didn't even know the term geoengineering. The materials that we've been working on, um, we supplied those along the way at different stages and um, got some of them to build into their campaign platform a denunciation, especially of um, carbon capture and storage. But uh, this is not something that was being openly spoken of much in the United States. And I think part of that is because we had an administration that wouldn't admit that there was a climate problem. So you can't really start talking about solutions if you won't admit that there's a problem. So there's been a, you know, a huge disconnect and, and I think a, a lot of catching up has to go on now in terms of, of uh, even those in, in different positions of government, including our, our friends and allies, so that they understand what's, what's coming along. Um, next slide, please. So what I was gonna talk about a little bit is my own community in Newark. As I said, all of uh, this city is designated as a, an environmental justice community by the EPA, meaning that it, everything has to be under special consideration. If you're trying to bring in more polluting facilities, uh, on the other hand, those things are constantly happening. People are always proposing a greater and more um, projects that are gonna to add to our, our pollution here. So the things that I'm gonna show on these slides are pretty much limited to the neighborhood that I live in, to this one community, which is the epicenter of um, air pollution, really, of CO2 pollution in, uh, in Northern New Jersey. Um, again, I wanna you know, remind you that we're, we're very, very close to New York City. Uh, the city has uh, been through a great deal 50 years ago, a bit more, there was a major uprising in Newark uh, and people haven't forgotten that. Um, and for, for decades, the city was uh, what they call redlined. You couldn't even get a loan to, to build here or um, there's a kind of economic or financial designation that makes certain cities a pariah for investment and so on. And so Newark is just beginning to come out of that um, from under that. And so now we're gonna be faced possibly with kind of uncontrolled development. So that's a new stage. Uh, I, um, I am the um, chair of the Environmental Commission of Newark, which is a, a, a free labor job uh, with a group of people who care about stuff like that. But that means that, you know, we, we do get to see when people are, when companies wanna bring in different types of, of projects here. Um, so right, right here, this is an example of an environmental justice community. The major seaport is here, the second biggest in the United States. Newark International Airport is here. There's a garbage incinerator that um, is the biggest in the region and burns uh, waste from all of the more affluent communities and a lot of waste from Manhattan. It's brought over here and burnt. It is a major source of air pollution. Uh, we also have waste transfer stations which, where they take um, one type of waste, uh, take, change the, the way, move it around so that it's um, present and, and active. We have a lot of scrap metal yards, which um, many of which have automotive scrap, which is, um, contains a lot of toxic elements. There are animal fat rendering plants, which makes things um, smell bad. There is a major sewage treatment plant. There's a gas-fired power plant that we didn't want that uses frack gas. Even though fracking is um, prohibited in New Jersey, it's not in our neighbor Pennsylvania. So that it gets brought over here and used. Next slide, please. I couldn't fit it all on one slide. There's major highways and railroad. 
thousands of diesel truck trips daily from the port coming through the community. And those are old diesel trucks. So they're um, elute, um, emitting particulate matter, uh, 2.5 particulate, and um, that's our biggest source of air pollution. There are large warehouses now to receive and distribute the goods coming in through the port. We are on, uh, and there's also an absence of tree cover. So this one section, which actually has about 50 to 60,000 residents, um, is, can be 10 degrees hotter than the rest of the city. Just to give an example, because we don't have very many trees. Um, the river here is the Passaic River, which is actually the cradle of industrialization in the United States. Um, it was contaminated during the Vietnam War with when they made Agent Orange here. So a byproduct of that is dioxin. So the river is dangerously contaminated with dioxin. It is the biggest uh, dioxin contaminated site in the world. It's taking decades to get that clean up and we still haven't had it. Um, we are low lying, which means that we are on a flood plain. Uh, we regularly flood. And, and now they also wanna bring in a sludge processing plant. So that is, uh, that litany is not unknown in other parts of the country, but I wanted to, to, um, to give that example of what an environmental justice, that's what they call it, it's really an environmental injustice um, city is like and the type of um, cumulative impact that, that we face. Um, in 2017, Newark passed a, a, a unique environmental justice and cumulative impacts law. New Jersey has just passed something similar and stronger for the entire state. We're in the process of developing the rulemaking for that because we don't know exactly how it's going to look, but it's, it's going to be, um, we're trying to make it so it covers a lot of things. Geoengineering is not discussed in those conversations. Um, in 2012, we experienced a superstorm, which is, was called Superstorm Sandy. Um, many parts of the United States flooded dangerously. Most people don't know that Newark um, suffered flooding and loss of life in that. And that was our first, I think, time that we recognized, even as a community organization with a strong environmental justice program, that that was a climate incident. Before that, we didn't understand climate change and how it applies to us. Um, when I was asked to talk about some of the ways communities are confronting um, climate change, here in Newark and many older cities in the United States, we have what they call combined sewer overflow. We're still operating on very, very old um, sewer systems and you know the way waste is moved through the city and so on so when it floods which is kind of frequently in some community some parts of the city um those pipes that whole thing overflows and so raw sewage and everything is combined and it's all going into the river together and that has been identified by the federal government as something that all the cities have to change and uh, so this under a lot of lengthy negotiations because it's going to cost money to the cities and to the residents to make these changes. And so all through um, the country communities are having this discussion about um, what to do about that. So as a, as a parallel thing, um, I mean, most people don't know that's going on, but it's a big deal in the towns that are going to have to and need to make that change because we're going to continue to flood and we can't continue to um, be exposing ourselves in, in, to toxicity the way we are. And I want to say that when we had the major Sandy flood, all of the things that I described earlier and particularly the scrap metal yards where steering wheels have um, mercury in them and things like that, um, the flood went through all of those places and then all of that flood water ended up in people's houses and some, some parks are no longer inhabitable. So that is kind of the most obvious thing that we're facing at this moment. Meanwhile, uh, in Congress, um, as you know, we've just come through some, some pretty intense shifts and the U.S. is now 
learning what it's like to live in an unstable country, something that many countries have dealt with for forever practically. Um, what we're seeing um, in the latest energy bill, um, and these things took place just before the election and got passed. Um, the latest energy bill, the spending package, the um, stimulus bill that's supposed to kick in to support people um, around the um, coronavirus um, that we're all experiencing and trying to deal with um, contains pretty, pretty, pretty enthusiastic geoengineering proposals. Suddenly, and they want to do ca um, carbon capture, including a lot of direct air capture everywhere, uh, talking about the different modalities of um, carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and use. Um, these things are showing up in bills and, the, and they're already there. And I can tell you that I know for sure that the, um, the Congress people do not even know what those things entail. We haven't had the opportunity to talk to very many of them, but the ones I did speak with and share our material with, even in recent weeks, most of this stuff was news to them because we've been dealing with so many other things. So the US is about to um, endorse and support um, a whole lot of stuff that people aren't used to and don't know it's coming. Um, majorly proposed as money-making opportunities which again, for Climate Justice Alliance, we, re we really reject market mechanisms for dealing with climate. And yet all of this is being proposed at this moment, completely parallel to the kinds of local um, initiatives or things that I would say are emergency requirements. No one is talking about what those things mean the cities are gonna be struggling to bring themselves up into a, a more modern way of dealing with, with um, the infrastructure without any discussion at all of the amount of money and stuff that's gonna be spent on carbon capture schemes, unproven things, let alone support for solar radiation management experiments, which again, very few people understand um, so I think I'm going to leave it there and, and look forward to questions, but I wanted to set the stage for that and sort of um, bring in, you know, what this means for the population and, and how um, the, the huge disconnect between these two types of solutions. So thank you. Thank you so much um, for your presentation. Um, Cynthia, and for giving us the context of the um, of the United States, I think often people tend to forget that um, when you speak about questions of climate justice or, or environment, questions of race and class must also uh, be centered. And um, as you're saying, from where you are, um, it's a space that's very overburdened, but uh, not just a space that's overburdened. Um, environmental injustice. Um, people of color are uh, particular black people, people of color are um, particularly overburdened by um, climate injustice. And we can extend this analysis to um, the rest of the, uh, the global South. So thank you very much. Uh, we are now entering the very final uh, part of this um, conversation. And I'd, I'd like to basically, um, you know, sort of wrap up uh, in terms of, um, or give a response to what um, has been said or to the highlights of what has been said. So, um, of course, um, starting with the fact that, you know, geoengineering, uh, we've seen from Ned's presentation that geoengineering um, technologies, these experiments are too risky, effects uncertain, and pose uh, serious environmental risks. We've also seen that there's an existing de facto moratorium backed by 196 countries. Uh, and this are parties to the UN Convention on Biodiversity CBD. Although we must say that the US is not a party to the CBD. We've also seen that uh, from 
the presentation by Sam is that techno fixes like geoengineering have to date not brought us closer to solving the climate crisis, but instead have enriched a few corporations and elite research institutions based in the global north. And this has been very clear also in Lindsay's uh, presentations. We also see that this techno fixes also serve to continue legitimizing the, with the agribusiness and fossil fuel industries in that the idea being pushed is that business as usual can go on as long as we have these solutions. Um, we've also seen that uh, worryingly um, is the use of the term nature-based solutions, which seems to mean everything and nothing at the same time, means whatever it means, wherever it travels, sort of a traveling uh, term, although it seems that there's a particular hegemony in terms of the way it's thought of, and this uh, mainstream normative idea of how, what nature-based solutions is coming from transnational corporations, uh, Western governments, and also uh, very big conservancies. And you see that nature-based solutions or NBS is opening the door for this risky technologies and other false solutions to the climate crisis. And meanwhile, as this is happening, billions across the world, largely living in the global south and also poor uh, impoverished communities in the global north, continue to be on the front lines of the climate and environmental crisis with little to no relief being offered to them. In addition, we see the race and class dynamics of environmental injustice in the global north, of course, as I just mentioned in terms of, and also in terms of uh, Cynthia's presentation. So black, people of color, indigenous people continue to be disproportionately affected by climate in, uh, by the climate crisis, but also by environmental policies being pushed at state and national um, level. So that is basically to wrap up the conversation and the main talking points from um, the four panelists. And so I'm going to open it up very quickly to two questions, uh, to open it up to um, one main thing. So we have a few questions that have come in. Um, um, oh, also, I'm at, oh yeah, they've already done it, sorry. So there's a particular question which I see that Neth has answered, but I think it would be good to sort of exploit for just, you know, slightly, um, just to explore this question also. There's a, there's a question that came in from anonymous attendee. Hi, anonymous attendee. Uh, how can we apply geoengineering within the local community. Now, this is something that you want to take again, like in a, um, you know, um, just have a more in depth because, you know, there are conversations around, you know, we could do it at small scale. Um, and in fact, just a few months ago, we know that there was an article which we were responding to in which it was proposed that, um, you know, local communities in Africa could actually do geo uh, engineering and we were opposed to that and we gave a response to that. So um, is it something that you could explore here? Why not? Why not have local communities? Um, the same way we have agroecology, you know, or, or the same way we have, you know, solar, you know, being done by um, small communities. Why can't we have local communities um, uh, doing their own small geoengineering projects? Is this possible? Well, it should be possible if you do it like top down, if you impose it, if you tell communities this is what we want to do. But we are talking here of locally led adaptation action. Now we should not lose sight of the context of this conversation. And for us, um, there is inherent incompatibility um, between what it entails, like to deploy or to do research. Um, out there um, on geoengineering and to do locally locally led um, adaptation um, action. I'll cite an example. I think it's much more um, concrete. When the Australian scientist cum businessmen um, did their experiment on um, nitrogen fertilization in the south um, in the Sulu Sea, northern Sulu Sea, here in the Philippines, it actually straddles between Malaysia and the Philippines. When they did that, they actually tried this concept of doing the experiment with local communities. What they did was to go around uh, villages and local governments, present their experiments, and told the government later that we're doing this with communities because they went there. They explained their, um, their experiments. I, I don't know how they did it. And but but basically what Sam was um, telling us about the promotion of iron fertilization in 
in Chile was basically what was presented by the Australian scientists at that time that this is for sustainable fisheries that um, uh, promoting um, nitrogen fertilization in certain dead part, you know, the the dead part of the of the northern Sulu Sea, it could actually promote and also um, encourage sustainable fisheries by um, uh, promoting the growth of phytoplankton, um, and that those phytoplankton will provide food for more fishes and and all that. And that, that um, the promotion that they did, actually they put it on paper that they're doing it with communities. And it's basically just them telling communities, this is our idea, this is what we want to do, and we want, we want to do it with you. Which to us is really antithetical to doing it with community because you don't just come, um, coming from the sky with an idea and say that this is, I want you to do because I think this is good for you. So, like, I think we, we really have to um, interrogate that closely. Like, I think that the experiences of, of experiments done with communities in the name of communities, but not really um, with the full participation, not even um, involving communities in making decisions on is this the technology or is this the solution we want to take? Um, to address a particular problem rather than outsiders telling us that this is what we want to to give you as a solution to your problem. And we have to, to really go to the depth of this in order to to answer that question. Um, it's easy to answer it um, on surveys, and but it's actually harder and I think more meaningful if we go deeper into what we mean by with with um, local communities and for whom and who are behind like um Ruth mentioned I think Lee, uh, Lindsay talked about that um lengthily about the political um the political players no uh, behind um we're talking of 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 um the um the politics behind and also if we go deeper on who are the proponents no like um um whose interests are behind um this um technology and interrogate that based on the lens of communities, um, as um, described by, Phil, uh, by by Cynthia, for example, in the context of the U.S. So it's a lengthy answer, which I think um, merits the the nature of the question because that is very strategic in nature. It could actually divide communities. It could actually distract us from real solutions that that lay in the hands of communities and. And if we answer it, if we satisfy ourselves in shallow answers, superficial answers, we will actually be um, risking, um, taking the risk of like providing a superficial solution that will inherently disempower communities in the long run. Thank you so much, Neth. And I think your answer also raises one, one thing that um, many of us working on climate justice have been thinking about is the co-option of communities, but even the co-option of uh, terms like climate justice. We now see oil companies which basically pay uh, paramilitaries to evict people from their land, talking about promoting climate justice. So, I mean, everyone now talks about climate justice and it's, it's one of those things, you're also not sure what exactly do you mean by uh, climate justice, a term that was very, very radical, has very radical roots, now being um, casually thrown about in, in documents and websites by some of the biggest emitters and abusers of uh, people's rights. Um, so to finally end this, um, so this is a final question to the panelists. So we've had a full length conversation around uh, geoengineering, um, you know, adaptation in local communities, the context of local, local communities. And as a home campaign at the beginning, we spoke about, or rather I spoke about what uh, some of our demands are. Uh, so as a final, um, as a final conversation or as a final uh, talking point, if someone was to come over to you, Sam, Cynthia, Lindsay, Neth, and said, okay, fine, um, we are rejecting geoengineering, we're rejecting techno fixes, what are, what are the solutions? What are you demanding? What is this new world of justice that um, you are envisioning? What will be the answer? As a final, very brief remarks.
Anyone can start. May I say something? Well, it's uh, it's not about actually to have technologies that can be address the consequences of the of the whole thing. You know, we need to actually to work in, in technologies and policies and understanding the new system that actually address the causes, not the consequences of this thing, right? So it's not actually just come out with a bunch of techno fix all around the world and try to actually to get a, a patent, you know, to actually to sell after afterwards to any any country that want to actually address this calamity, right? Because actually we're in a crisis. So we have to stop, we wasted our time, our money, our technology, you know, in, in this te techno fixing. You know, we actually try to address the real causes as Lindsay, you know, address and net as well. And also that is some, something that actually we say all around that we actually have this, we have also participate in the political process. We need more leaders. We need more actually champions of the environment. We need more uh, people actually are willing to change the system and about this kind of, um, uh, how can I say, um, uh, dreams, you know, uh, that somebody actually want to address and get some money out of this crisis. That's uh, my opinion. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you so much. I'll go. Uh, we need to keep fossil fuels in the ground. We need to end this extractive way of doing things. It can be done uh, in many ways. The extractive economy, the fossil fuel economy uh, is really feeling the hit. And, and um, But the, the thing with these geoengineering techno fixes is that they don't address that. They don't ask people to change their behavior. Uh, they don't ask for an end to extraction and they don't even uh, clean up the air. They're just, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a distraction. So um, that's our position in fossil fuel extraction. And I think people, you know, we fought hard to end some of the pipeline work. And I understand President Biden, and that's the first time I've used that term, yeah, apparently put an end to the Exxon pipeline, again, stopped it but that a whole other system of pipelines would have to be constructed to carry the liquefied CO2, right? That's a result of, of, of all this um, carbon capture that they're proposing. So we, we have to put it into the whole thing. And again, using a just transition because we have ways, I mean, certainly people in those industries, workers can't be hurt. So we need a really comprehensive and realistic work with labor unions uh, and others to make sure that um, that there's a full change that takes place. And certainly that's gonna take a lot of trust and a lot of willingness, but I have seen some communities who are worried about the end of let's say coal, uh, actually looking for the idea of being carbon capture of having a storage space there. So that makes me really nervous because that's what they did with fracking. They went to economically devastated places in, in the Midwest and offered them fracking uh, projects. And so they're paying the consequences of that now. So, you know, we have to look at the whole picture. Thank you. Thank you for talking about a just transition. That's a conversation to have, but it's an important conversation to have about how we move from this, where we are from point A to point B. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Uh, Lindsay? Great, thank you so much. And thank you to all the presenters and for this very interesting discussion. I mean, I think, you know, it's not an easy answer. I mean, I think we unfortunately live in a world that is structured in a very specific way. And, uh, you know, I think we all are all struggling with kind of looking at well, what does it look like? Is it a transition? Is it sudden? Is it about moments and small micro, you know, cracks in the system? I think we're all, you know, this is a challenge for all of us who live today as, as the youth, as people who've been around, you know, there's a lot of problems I think that we are sitting with. And I think we can't, it's difficult to kind of, uh, for me anyway, to sort of think that the, the it really exists, I must be honest. I think, I mean, one thing that's been said already, and I think it's so obvious, is that um, as it was said by Sam, you know, 
we have to stop the tech with the with what is causing the problem <laughs> you cannot solve things while there's ongoing um you know biodiversity loss deforestation um like all carbon and other other things which are really stimulating the issue they're perpetuating the issue they're going to make it worse you know when you look at any of any aspects around this the science the human rights every aspect around it right it's like it's only feeding the issue it cannot be solved without stopping it at source i think that this is um this is a, a very obvious thing which I, unfortunately none of these things that we're talking about address and as as i was saying right like these are just technologies that are dealing with the outcome and not the causes and it's it's not it's just impossible to have that discussion because they simply don't work and i think that's just the issue that we're facing um and leading to a lot of um other major issues that are just like fueling again the crisis so i think you know when you're talking about carbon talking about biodiversity loss those are just i mean they have to be the, the place where you start and then you know there's a lot of other things that need to be to be worked with simultaneously because when you're speaking about the financial system you're speaking about um tax justice issues other things that are kind of inherently linked and part of the issue these are kind of the more uh, geopolitical discussions and i think that um there is work that needs to be done that that is difficult to really say but because we sit in a system which is so focused on this kind of capital capitalist structure and a very specific notion how do we shift that is you know it's a very very difficult thing and we need to find a way and it needs to be built from the ground and um, we cannot come with, up with those answers and i think it's about creating these not just alternatives because alternatives are like not part of the mainstream we need the, the alternative has to become the norm you know um agroecology biodiverse agricultural systems this should be the norm because the other thing just contributes to problems you know so we have to be shifting that mentality and i i i think it has to operate on all the levels at the the international level it has to operate at local levels because i don't know i you know where all the change will happen in in terms of the urgency that we need um and i think we're dealing with a lot of other issues especially in africa where we have um you know there's lack of democracy there's a lack of of the realization of human rights and this is a major issue for us because it makes us in, it's, it's unable to even use that as a space to to force sort of governments to um listen you know to what communities are saying what people are saying and this and it's just again perpetuating a sort of under-resourced um and really situation um that is very difficult and I, and i and i guess i sitting here with a it's a great frustration and in, in that sense but i do think that there is a lot of possibility and i think we just need to be starting in all these levels and i think i know it doesn't really answer the question but i think that they're they're all have to happen and we have to be building it and i think they the, the examples exist I, i believe that the examples exist already for us to work with and we need to hold people accountable in that way and we need systems that allow for that Thank you, Lindsay, for reminding us that uh, what we call alternatives have actually been practices also that many communities across the world have done for hundreds and thousands of, of years and should actually be the norm. Thank you for that. Uh, Neth, do you want to be the, the, I mean, you're going to be the last one. Do you want to close? Uh, yes. close it? It, it's nice to, to, to talk um, after three wonderful speakers who actually rep rep represented what i wanted to say i will not be repeating what they what they said but just to emphasize that um strategically the responses um should go beyond superficial responses and those that do not change um the fundamentals the structural um problems the root causes of the problems and also does not change anything in the power dynamics that brought us to where we are, uh, that brought the problems in the first place, would not change anything. It will just um, reinforce um, the existing inequalities, the existing problems, and worse, it would cause uh, further disempowerment of the of those um, communities that are um, on the ground. You no, know? like um, and what is um, further more um, revolting about this? idea of imposing techno fixes is 
we hear more and more language saying that this is for communities, that this is with communities, but that's just um, lip service. We know that um, it remains to be top down, it remains to be pushed by the same interests that have brought the problems um, and also the same interests that impede us from addressing the root causes of the problem. And I also believe that there are already um, existing models and examples of how um, local communities could actually address the, the, the problems um, um, caused by climate change and also addressing the root causes in their own little ways. Um, it's just that there is this fascination about large scale, fascination about one time, big time um, changes and also fascination about something that comes from the top developed by big names in, in academia and forgetting that in the end it's actually the the grassroots as mentioned by Sylvia by, by Cynthia and communities who who are um, bearing the brunt of the problem who are also going to bear the brunt when things go wrong in the prescribed um, solution. So it's high time that we go beyond the lip service that we go um, towards really operationalizing um, community empowerment and really working with communities. And we could start by really um, giving um, power into the hands of, of communities in assessing and critically looking at the technologies that are being um, prescribed from outside and also um, give space you know, for communities to innovate and also um, address the, the their situation, their problems coming from um, their um, um, existing capacities and also using um, resources that exist and um, respecting um, the interaction with, with nature. So thank you for um, organizing the panel. And also, I think we have to, to thank um, Gobishona for giving us this space and we're looking forward to a Gobishana that would actually provide space for grassroots communities and civil society to present um, research, because I understand that Gobishana means research, research that matters, uh, research that is relevant in people's lives and research that comes from, from the people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ned. A stop to all large-scale monoculture plantations a stop to any public funding for geoengineering projects, recognition of the inherent rights of indigenous peoples, their livelihoods and cosmovisions, including the right of self-determination, respect and effective guarantees for the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities' right to free prior and informed consent, respect for peasant rights, lands and territories, paving the way for food sovereignty, support for and strengthening of meaningful investigations into just, sustainable, and trans transformative pathways to limit global warming, global warming. And finally, to build, to put forward the building blocks for a justice-based transformative tra trajectory towards climate justice. These are some of um, the solutions and demands of um, the home campaign. Thank you so much to everyone who has been here with us. I know we've taken a bit more time. I know it's on a Saturday. I, I, it's a Saturday in January uh, in the second year of the pandemic. So I know this is a very difficult thing for many of you. Thank you so much to the rapporteurs. Thank you so much to the technical team. Thank you truly to ICAD for organizing this uh, conference and allowing us to have um, our session here. And of course, thank you to everyone at the home campaign, uh, the ETC group and uh, the Heinrich Wall Foundation. Um, we wish you a happy rest of the Saturday or almost Sunday or just before Saturday like Cynthia, who hasn't quite started the day. Um, please feel free to uh, visit our website. We've taken some of your email uh, contact addresses and we'll be sending out information to those who've reached out to us uh, beginning next week. Once again, thank you very much. Have a fantastic day and solidarity. Thank you from the home campaign team.